For the last 300 years, Oak Island in Canada has been the site of a massive treasure hunt. There are rumours of Shakespearean manuscripts, the Holy Grail and the Ark of the Covenant, all being buried here by people long, long ago from the other side of the world who I never even thought made it to North America. This is just one of the many mysteries that we will be exploring in this episode. So without further ado, grab a drink. My choice today is green tea with bergamot and come with me as we explore the unsolved mystery iceberg. Missy Beaver's murder. So this is actually one that I covered on an old channel of mine and it's actually still up here on YouTube so if you can find the video and the channel I would be really impressed. Missy Beavers was a very active mum of three who regularly held fitness boot camps and classes in the Church of Christ 20 minutes from where she lived. On the morning of April 18th 2016 she was found dead in inside the church, brutally beaten to death with a hammer or pick. And when they checked the church's security footage, they found this. This person was dressed in police tactical gear and was seen at roughly 4am walking through the hallways, randomly smashing windows and trying to open doors. Then at 4.18am, Missy was seen entering the church and just before the class's start time at 5am, Missy was found dead. There's no footage of the actual murder, but the person in the security footage is thought very, very likely to be the killer. And it's actually somewhat hard to tell if this was a woman or a man. They could have been a broad-shouldered woman. It's kind of hard to tell underneath all of the tactical gear. Their height was kind of middling, so they could have been a shorter guy or a taller woman, but they were never identified. The person in the security footage seems to walk with a limp of sorts, and Missy's husband's father actually does walk with a limp but he had a perfect alibi for that morning. The husband of Missy didn't seem overly emotional in any following interviews, but that is sometimes the case when loved ones die in horrific circumstances, as everyone just kind of handles it differently, I guess. And there are many different pieces of evidence pointing in many different directions for this one. One theory suggested that this limp was intentional, as maybe the killer knew that the husband's dad walked with a limp, and so they were maybe trying to frame him. There was nothing missing inside of the church, so a burglary gone wrong is kind of unlikely. But it is thought that the killer possibly smashed windows and tried to open doors in order to make it look like a burglary. Missy didn't really have any enemies, so the whole motive behind the killing is still kind of unknown. For a full in-depth rundown on the murder, Missy the different suspects, all the different evidence, and the many theories, I would recommend you check out the full, poor quality, embarrassing video on my old channel. That's if you can find it. The navigation paradox basically says that the more advanced and precise navigation gets through things like GPS, optimization of routes, and coordination between different crafts, the likelihood of collision actually goes up. This is because the routes and paths are so optimized that if communication ever breaks down between two different crafts, they will likely just default to the most optimized route, which is so precise and optimized that many different crafts will take it, resulting in more collisions. The Nazca Lines are a group of what's called geoglyphs in the Nazca Desert, Peru. They were made sometime between 500 BC and 500 AD, and were made by people digging in the desert to a certain pattern, and with this digging they revealed the different coloured earth that was below the sand. This bottom layer, which was very high in lime, reacted with the morning mist and moisture and actually hardened, forever solidifying the lines in place. These lines could obviously not have been seen from above in the years that they were made, but there have been between 80 and 100 found in recent years with the help of things like drones. The patterns all describe different things. Hummingbirds, fish, monkeys, dogs and cats, and even things like trees and flowers. And there are quite a few different theories as to why they were made. One was to contact or showcase their skills or dedication to things like gods or even aliens, or to indicate and signal water flow in certain areas. Or it could have been something space related, 
related, helping them track and locate stars and predict equinoxes. Their purpose is a little unclear, but they are fantastic creations when you think that the people who made them never even saw them as we do today. The ground level view looks pretty normal and mundane and boring. They just seem like random holes dug in the dirt, but they likely made them for all powerful gods. Up high, looking down on their creations, as we do today, which kind of puts things in perspective a little bit. The North Carolina rumbling mountains. This is a reference to the shaking ground and loud booms that were heard and felt in the Bald Mountain, North Carolina, 1874. Some saw smoke and vapors coming out of the ground, leading to fears of a soon to explode volcano. So panic set in and everyone was scared stiff for roughly two months. This received tons of media coverage as all of the newspapers and reporters flocked to the area to investigate. Apparently the rumbles all started after a local preacher held a religious revival, praying that God make the mountain shake and tremble beneath their feet. People were apparently freaking out, releasing their cattle and animals out into the woods, and praying like mad as they believed they only had a few days to live. I mean, why they didn't just, you know, move out of the area? I don't know. But when investigators looked for causes of the event, they couldn't even find evidence for the rumbles taking place in the first place. The only evidence there was, was eyewitnesses. There was no evidence for any of the trembles or shakes, or for smoke or steam coming out of the ground. So a few newspapers were naturally a little dubious of the people's claims. And that was it. The occurrences never occurred again, and everyone just went home. Very strange. Nemesis was a hypothetical red or brown dwarf put forward in 1984. It was thought to be orbiting our sun at a distance of 1.5 light years. They theorized that our sun was part of a binary system with a star called Nemesis. Now, binary systems are something that I covered in a previous episode, but it's basically just a system where at the center you have two stars orbiting each other instead of just the one star. Now, normally in binary systems, you'd expect the stars orbiting each other to be a little bit closer than this. But in theory, something like this is perfectly possible. Apparently our sun used to be a member of this binary system and over the years this other star Nemesis had just gotten further and further away as it orbited our sun and this was partly used to explain mass extinctions that apparently happen on earth every roughly 26 million years and it was thought that when Nemesis was in a certain position this somehow led to extinctions. This one's a bit wild and hypothetical, and there's no real evidence for this one outside of theory, but it is a cool one to think about nonetheless. Novelesnaya Street, Jane Doe. This was an unidentified woman found dead in Moscow, 2006. She was shot dead and was thought to be a victim of the later convicted serial killer, Alexander Elestratov. He robbed and killed six people between 2005 and 2007, and and sadly, this Jane Doe was one of them. They were never able to identify her, so who she is remains a mystery. The Oak Island Mystery. This was a very fun one to research and explore, partly because it's about buried treasure, which who doesn't love a good pirate story, and partly because I got to go so in depth with some of the theories on this one. This one is regarding a few unexplained mysteries and objects found on or near Oak Island in Nova Scotia, Canada. This looks to be a fantastic spot to bury treasure if you're a pirate, and this same belief shared amongst people since the 1700s has led over the years to many, many attempts to discover and retrieve this treasure. There are all all sorts of theories about what type of treasure might be on this island. Shakespearean manuscripts, the Holy Grail and the Ark of the Covenant are just some of many that have apparently been buried there by the Knights Templar. Now, if you'll allow me to detour a little bit, while I was researching this, I did a little deep dive into the Knights Templar. Most people will know that they were basically an elite fighting force or order of the Catholic Church. They were among the most elite and skilled fighters during the Crusades, but about 90% of the members in the order were non-combat members, and a lot of these members were incredible with money and business. The 
order innovated and revolutionized a bunch of modern financial techniques and developed one of the earliest forms of banking. They were a two-pronged force essentially and allowed them to conquer different countries and areas to secure or steal or win various artifacts, money, gold, rare items, etc. And with their financial and business skills, they were able to set up banking systems, organize all of the wealth, make a fair amount of profit from lending money, and so they were quite a well-rounded force. So after 200 years of this, the order eventually began to decline in membership, with King Philip IV of France pressuring Pope Clement to essentially give up and disband the order. Many of the order's members in in France were arrested, tortured into giving false confessions, then burnt at the stake. And a few years after this, the order was officially disbanded. But during this time, a lot of the members naturally fled. Now, the question of where exactly they fled to is still a little uncertain. And a lot of the treasure that they recovered over the years has never been accounted for or recovered. So naturally, there have been many, many things theories over the years about where the members of the order went and where the treasure that they had is located. One theory suggests that as the order was collapsing, the members of the order took their treasure from Paris to the port in La Rochelle. From there they took a boat to Scotland where they were welcomed by the powerful Sinclair family, who were actually long-term allies of the order. The Sinclair family had actually known the first Grand Master of the Templar Knights, Hugh de Pay and had helped members of the order hide in Scotland for decades. Now, the story goes that because Christianity was so widespread, they hatched a plan to go to a part of the world that Christianity would never reach, the New World, which later became known as North America. And yep, Christianity never reached the New World. The head of the Sinclair family, Henry Sinclair, apparently knew about the New World through his Viking ancestors, who did actually sail to and start small colonies in North America around the 10th century. And the land of the Vikings and Northern Scotland are probably a lot closer than you might think. A lot of the Viking invaders actually settled down and had families, and so a lot of the modern Scottish people are actually descendants of Vikings. In fact, the red hair that most people associate with the Irish or the Scots actually originated in Vikings and it was thought that most Vikings at a particular point in time actually had red hair. So the plan was to take all of the members of the order across the Atlantic Ocean using possibly Viking maps. They would take them into the land of the free, home of the brave, with all of their treasure. There are a few bits of somewhat debated evidence for this theory. A guard tower built in Newport, a carving of a knight on a glacial boulder in Westford, and the money pit and treasure on Oak Island. But before I come full circle back around to Oak Island, an interesting theory that I read was that the Freemasons were essentially an offshoot of the Templar Knights, and they were able to access all of the Templars' knowledge and treasure, which allowed them to fight and win the Revolutionary War. But but back to the Oak Island mystery. One theory says that a dying sailor from the crew of Captain Kidd, who died in 1701, swore that there was buried treasure there worth two million pounds, which is close to 150 million today. The story then goes that Daniel McGuinness, a settler in the 1700s, found a depression in the ground while looking for a place to start his farm. Believing this to be the treasure mentioned in the Captain Kidd's story, Daniel then got the help of two other men and began digging in the ground. They apparently found signs of human activity, markings and scrapings, purposefully placed stones, and in some stories, wooden platforms. But they gave up digging at around 30 feet due to superstitious dread, whatever that means. Over the next few hundred years, many, many excavations took place, some going as far down as 235 feet, but many had to 
stop just due to the pit flooding with water every single time. The water was thought to be connected to the ocean somehow through flood tunnels, as it seemed to actually rise and fall with the tide. And there were actually divers sent down, but these dives didn't identify or find any treasure. And interestingly enough, people like FDR were actually heavily invested in this mystery, even throughout his presidency and up until his death in 1945, as were the actors Errol Flynn and John Wayne. There is a curse apparently on the treasure that is said to have originated more than a century ago and it states that seven men will die in search of this treasure before the treasure is found and to this date only six men have died. Did the Templars bury their treasure here and through these sinkholes just lose it to the great void of the ocean below? Did they bury it somewhere else on the island or maybe on the mainland? Or did they never make it to North America at all? I actually love these types of mysteries, as the more and more you read about it, it kind of reads like you're living a alternate history, or history of an alternate reality, or potentially an actual version of history. We don't really know. And that is all we have- I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Do not close the video. But that was a long entry and I really enjoyed it and if you don't mind me doing mini deep dives like this in the future, when I come across a really interesting entry or topic, then do let me know in the comments below as otherwise I'll just try and keep them a little bit shorter. The Ontario Lake Mystery Ancient Structure is somewhat related to our last entry as it's in the same area of Eastern Canada, but it takes us back, way back, to potentially around 10 10,000 years ago. History in Eastern Canada is generally divided into two periods. The first being since around the 10th century, which is when early white European settlers came, and the second stage being around a thousand or two years before that, which is represented by rock carvings and glyphs, as well as stone mounds and arrowheads, and these were from the North American natives. But there may very well be a third stage. This takes us as far back as 10,000 years ago, before there was any forest in the nearby land, and when the land was just recovering from the recent ice age. Human populations back then weren't in the billions, millions, or even thousands. Most every tribe or group of people consisted of maybe a few dozen at the most, maybe up to a hundred in some rare cases per group or tribe. Obviously this was far, far back, the landscape was in entirely different. Ice where there are now trees, water where there is now land, land where there is now water. But there was a fascinating structure found in Ontario Lake that is proof, some people believe, of intelligent life. Likely humans around this era building structures of sorts. What was found was a huge thousand pound rock carefully rested on and propped up by seven smaller rocks. These were all sat on top of an even larger several thousand pound slab, which was on the edge of a under water ledge. So it is thought that these early early humans for some reason built this structure, which at the time might have just been part of the land. The lake was also thought to have been a ancient spot of worship or reverence for these people, which might explain why they chose to build this structure in this particular spot. The Overton Bridge is a bridge on a road approaching Overton House, which is a grandiose semi-famous house in Dunbartonshire, Scotland. It was built in a 1895, but since the 1950s, there have been many, sadly, strangely, reports of dogs either falling off or jumping to their deaths. The fall itself is about 50 feet or 15 meters, and it goes straight down onto the rocks below. It has been morbidly dubbed the dog suicide bridge by some, and there have been a whole range of theories and explanations for this one. Dogs who were normally very well behaved, rational and calm, would just suddenly run off the edge and jump off. Some people believe that the 
bridge is haunted and there are dark spirits leading and luring the dogs off the edge for whatever reason. Some people believe that the slope of the bridge as well as the foliage kind of blends in with the rocks below. So it's kind of an optical illusion for the dogs and they don't really see the height of the fall. And some people believe that other animals such as minks or squirrels are responsible for these incidents. Anyone who owns a dog will know that squirrels drive them mad and apparently dogs go mad for mink scent. So it is said that they chase the squirrels in the bushes and follow the scent of these minks which essentially lead them to being distracted and they go off the edge of the cliff. Whatever you believe is the cause for this phenomenon. It is a little unusual and very sad. So rest in peace to all of those dogs. The Penn Station Sniper. In 1953 a 50-year-old homeless woman was sitting on the floor of a homeless shelter when she was shot in the hip by an unidentified gunman through an open window in the shelter. This was the first of seven sniper attacks in and around the Pennsylvania station over the next two years. All seven victims were shot with a 25 caliber pistol and all were shot through windows, over ledges, basically from anywhere that it would be hard to identify or see the shooter. Because of this, authorities said that the shooter is likely quite young and fit and nimble in order to quickly climb up and out of certain areas. The shootings only stopped when the shooter's seventh victim, an Amtrak engineer, was actually shot in the head while crossing a set of train tracks at 7 a.m. on February 21st, 1984. This was the first and only victim of the shootings to unfortunately pass away, and that marked the end of the shootings. The shooter, sniper, killer was never identified and while it's true that serial killings are often solved many years after they actually take place it does seem somewhat unlikely that the killer behind these 40 year old shootings will ever be caught or brought to justice. The Persian princess refers to the mummy of an alleged Persian princess found in Pakistan 2000. It was dated to around 600 BC, wrapped in an Egyptian style wrapping and rested in a gilded wooden coffin or all inside of a stone sarcophagus. The coffin was carved with a large image of the Faravaha, which is a common symbol in the Zoroastrian religion of Iran. The mummy was laid atop a layer of wax and honey and was adorned with a golden crown and golden chest plate. There was actually an inscription on the chest plate which claimed that she was the unknown daughter of King Xerxes of Persia. It was speculated that she might have been an Egyptian princess that was married to a Persian prince. Because because mummification was primarily an Egyptian tradition and they had never before found a mummy in Persia. So this was a huge find. However, a little later on, independent parties actually had pieces of the coffin carbon dated and found that it was only 250 years old. So because of this, the police were called Interpol was contacted and they later realized that the corpse wasn't even as old as the 250 year old coffin. The body showed signs of decomposition fungus and the mat underneath the body was only around five years old. Upon further inspection the Persian that was written on the chest plate actually had modern grammatical errors and the heart of this mummy was removed along with all of the other organs where in a genuine Egyptian mummification the heart was always left inside the body. So in 2001, it was determined that the Persian princess was likely a woman between the ages of 21 and 25 who had died sometime around 1996, likely from being hit by a car. This death was obviously covered up and made to look like a rare ancient find. And there was an investigation done into this now suspected murder case, but nothing came from it and this woman identity remains a mystery. Peter Bergman was first spotted in a bus station in Derry Island on the 12th of June 2009. He then boarded a bus to County Sligo carrying a black shoulder bag as well as another piece of luggage. After arriving in Sligo he checked into his hotel 
he paid cash and gave the false name of Peter Bergman. He was five foot ten of slender build with blue eyes and short grey hair, and he appeared to be in his late fifties, early sixties. According to the staff of the hotel, he spoke English with a thick German accent, and he was seemingly well dressed with clothes that were identified as being from CNA, which is a popular retail store in Europe, but mostly in Germany and Austria. He was a heavy smoker often caught on the CCTV camera going outside to smoke quite often. But one time he was seen leaving the hotel carrying a purple bag with him. When he returned from his walk, he had neither the purple bag or the contents. It is thought that he threw the items out in certain areas and bins, but oddly he was never caught on camera and so maybe knew some of the blind spots of the cameras. Because of this, police were never able to identify any of the things that he threw away and perhaps some of these things were things that maybe identified him. Over the next few days, he purchased several stamps and airmail stickers and took a taxi down to the local beach after asking the taxi driver for a nice quiet beach where he could swim. He later returned to the hotel but checked out the next day and headed out with his black shoulder bag the purple bag, as well as a piece of black luggage different to the one that he had before. He walked to the bus station, ordered a coffee and a sandwich, and while he was eating the sandwich, seemingly read or looked at several pieces of paper that were in his pockets. He then tore the papers in half and threw them in the bin. Then he boarded a bus to the beach that he had visited before, and was seen by several people on the beach who said that he was fairly normal and quite friendly. The next morning, Arthur Kinsella and his son found the man's body lying on the beach at six in the morning. He was wearing purple speedos with his underwear over the top of them and a navy t-shirt that was tucked into his speedos. They said a prayer for the man, called the police and Peter was later pronounced dead at 8 a.m. So all in all, this case was pretty strange. Most of his clothes were found left behind on the shore, but there was no money or wallet or form of identification. There was no evidence of any drowning but also no evidence of any foul play. So it is thought that the man perhaps died of a heart attack after getting into the water. On the outside, the man seemed to be in fairly healthy condition, but when tests were done, he was found to have advanced prostate cancer as well as bone cancer and did show signs of some form of heart disease. So a man in his condition would likely have been taking several medications and prescriptions, but there were no drugs found in his system whatsoever. As well as his fake name, he also gave a fake address and although the Austrian police were later informed of this case, with public appeals even going out in Austrian and German newspapers, Peter was never identified and no friends, family or maybe people he knew have ever come forward. The Phantom Sub is a reference to a submarine that was detected directly below the US Navy destroyer in 1945. This ship was patrolling the Pacific coast near San Francisco when an alarm sounded indicating that an enemy sub was directly below them. Immediately the depth of the sub was set and explosive charges were sent down and after a while these charges hit the sub with a huge explosion heard and felt on the ship. An oil slick was seen coming from below to the surface, indicating that the sub was hit, but they were then unable to detect the sub on the sonar. It was thought at the time that it was likely an enemy sub, maybe a Japanese one, but the sub was never found and it was never confirmed. So many people on board were skeptical that it was even an enemy sub. Years later, haunted by the possibility that this might have been a US sub, one of the crewmen requested the deck log and and war diary for the ship and found that there was no record of the sinking of that submarine and that there wasn't even a record of any submarines being hit off the coast of California. Later on he came to believe that the sub that they hit was a United States sub and that the military had in fact covered the whole thing up. Poe Toaster. So we covered the odd and suspicious death of writer Edgar Allan Poe in a previous episode and he was well liked by a lot of people for his fantastic writing both before and after his death and one of his fans, an unknown unidentified man, donned in a black cape, black hood and silver tipped cane, visited Poe's grave, poured a glass of cognac, gave a toast to Poe and left three roses in a specific layout on the grave 
life, along with the unfinished bottle of cognac. He did this often early in the morning when no one was around to see him, and he did this every year for 60 years. Although he kept to himself, didn't really like company, and often went very early in the morning to likely avoid being seen, he was spotted by some witnesses, more so in the later years, after his existence was known about. There were occasionally letters and notes left on Poe's grave, often expressing their love or appreciation for Poe, such as Edgar, I haven't forgotten about you. And in 1999, there was a note saying that the original toaster had died the previous year, and the tradition had been passed on to a son. Since then, there were longer letters and notes left, often being cryptic and cynical and critical of various things like the Iraq war. And the final note was left sometime between 2005 and 2008, and hinted that the tradition was coming to an end. So it seems like the younger son who had taken on this tradition, didn't seem to take it as seriously or as purely as his father did, which is sad, but 60 years is a long time to keep up a yearly tradition like this. It is still unknown who they were or why they decided to commemorate Poe, but it is great to see a fantastic writer like Poe being appreciated. Pope Joan was a legend of a female Pope who reigned for two years between 1855 and 1857. Her legend first appeared in several chronicles in the 13th century and soon after spread all throughout Europe. Most of these stories describe Joan as a very talented, learned woman, who actually became the Pope by disguising herself as a man. Her sex was eventually revealed when she gave birth during a procession, and she died shortly after, either through natural causes or by being murdered. So it is an interesting legend, and it first appeared in Jean de Maly's Chronicle, written around 1250, which contained mention of an unnamed female Pope, and the later Chronicum Pontificum et Imperatorum in the third 13th century, further explored this legend, introducing her name as Joan, noting that she ruled in the 9th century, and that she entered the church in order to follow her lover. The legend was thought as completely true until the 16th century, which is when doubts about its truth started to arise. It is now widely thought to be just a myth and a legend, but it might be possible that Joan did actually rule, and she fooled and embarrassed the church to such a degree that they just rewrote history and covered the whole thing up. It might be possible. The Prevention Paradox. This is the interesting observation that the majority of cases of a disease actually come from people who are at low to moderate risk of the disease, rather than from people who are at a higher risk for the disease. It sounds a little counterintuitive, but it makes a little more sense once it's explained. Down syndrome cases, as an example, are more likely to occur when a child is born to an older woman. But because so many young women give birth, Birth, and so few older women do, there are actually more children with Down syndrome born to younger women than older women. Alcohol problems is another example. Most alcohol problems are actually found in moderate drinkers, not excessive or dependent drinkers. Because yes, while a higher percentage of excessive drinkers will face problems, there are far far fewer excessive drinkers in numbers than there are moderate drinkers. So most of the hospital or health cases are from moderate drinkers. And so there is often a greater overall benefit in slightly reducing risk in the greater population, rather than massively reducing risk in the smaller population. This was a bit of a strange one, but it does make sense when you think about it, and it did kind of blow my mind a little bit. Property dualism is the view that while there is only one type of substance in the world, which are physical substances like the brain, there are two types of properties in the world, physical or mental properties. Physical properties would be stuff like shape, size, and and color, and mental properties would be ideas, sensations, and feelings. This one is quite short as it just covers a fairly simple idea, but overall I guess it explores the intangible mysteries of the mind that we are yet able to fully explain like consciousness. Red Bull Racing's stolen trophies. So in 2014, a gang of men, all wearing masks, drove a car through the front doors of the Red Bull Racing Company in Milton Keynes, England. They stole 60 motor racing racing trophies, and cash from several cash machines, all in all totaling up to about £900,000. And this series of thefts and break-ins caused an estimated £300,000. The gang was caught soon after, and most of the trophies were recovered, although not all of them, and where the others are to this day, we don't know. 
Robert Cooper. In 2004, 53-year-old Oki Albert Kite Jr. was found in his own basement, tied up, beaten, tortured, and stabbed to death. His wallet and phone were missing, and his debit card was later used at an ATM by an unidentified man. This man was driving Oki's truck and wearing a ski mask. It is thought that this was likely the killer, and that this killer was likely a man who had rented a room from Oki. This man would apparently go to great lengths to hide his face, when he was in the presence of anyone except Oki, and when they looked into it, they found that all the information this man had given for the rental was all fake information. The name he gave, Robert Cooper, was also fake. It is thought that he was connected in some way to the Turkish Hezbollah, due to some similarities in the techniques of torture that were used, and the man's DNA was found at the scene, which linked him to the Balkan area. It is unknown what connection this man had to Oki, if there was any at all, and why this man chose to attack, torture, and kill Oki. But this was all the way back in 2004, and there really hasn't been much, if any, progress on the case. Ronald Hughes was a defense attorney who was appointed to represent Charles Manson, the well-known cult leader and killer, in his trial in 1970. This was over the murder of Tate LaBianca, and Charles Manson's strategy was to get three girls in his cult to openly admit to the murder, and to say that Charles Manson himself had nothing to do with it. But two weeks before the trial started, another attorney was appointed to represent Manson, and Ronald Hughes was reassigned to represent one of the other girls in the cult. However, when it came to the trial, Ronald would not let his client openly testify and incriminate herself by admitting to the murder. This infuriated Manson, as Hughes was, intentionally or not, messing with Manson's plan. The trial then went on a 10-day recess, and the last thing that Manson said to Hughes was that he didn't want to see him in the courthouse again. So during these 10 days, Hughes went on a little camping trip with some friends two hours northwest to a remote area in Los Padres National Forest. His friends went back home after a massive rainstorm, but Hughes decided to stay and finish up his closing statement for the case. The others hitchhiked back because this was the 70s, and after that, Hughes would be seen by three hikers, who were the last people to see Hughes alive. The rainstorm just got worse, and flash floods started to happen, and when the trial eventually resumed, Hughes was nowhere to be seen. The trial went on without him, and was eventually concluded, and it was only after four months that a severely decomposed body was found, just seven miles from where Hughes was last seen. This was confirmed to be Hughes, and his body was unclothed, eaten away by animals and had its entire right arm missing. There apparently wasn't any sign of foul play, but the Manson family did take credit for the killing, saying it was part of their retaliation killings, but it's still unclear whether it actually was or they were just doing that in order to seem a little more dangerous and scary. Interestingly, in a little twist of irony, the day that Hugh's body was found was the exact same day that the people on trial were given the death sentence. Just a bit of morbid coincidence. Sabrina Eisen was a five-month-old girl who was kidnapped from her home in Florida in 1997. Her mother, Marlene Eisenberg, woke up at 6 a.m. to find her missing. Their garage door had apparently been left open all night, and the door from the garage to the inside of the house was also left open. So, just based on these circumstances, the police first suspected the mother and her husband, although they denied any involvement. Police thought that the parents' public appeal was a bit suspicious, and they were apparently seen smiling after leaving their house. Marlene took a polygraph test, but was apparently hysterical and screaming and crying while taking it, so the results were inconclusive, and police say that the parents were not cooperative at all, and that they haven't yet been ruled out as suspects in Sabrina's disappearance. There was no sign of forced entry, no apparent motives, and there was no ransom note left. Two years later, the parents were arrested, and they were charged with conspiracy, lying to authorities, and and giving false information. There were also wiretaps of the two parents saying stuff, like the baby's dead and buried. It was found dead because you did it. The baby's dead no matter what you say. 
you just did it. And the father saying, I wish I hadn't hurt her. They don't know the truth, right? The judge, however, didn't agree that this is what the parents said and was kind of jumbled, so it was hard to hear what they were actually saying. And so two years after this, the judge dropped all the charges on the two. And there haven't been any suspects in the case since. There were a few girls who were thought to be Sabrina over the years, but when their DNA was tested, they were found not to be a match. And so the current fate of this once little girl is still unknown. The Sandown Clown. This was a strange being encountered by two small children on vacation at Lake Common on the Isle of Wight in 1973. They were following a strange sound, like an ambulance siren, and it led them to this strange creature, which was some sort of cross between a clown, robot, and alien. It was over two meters tall, had a thin frame, and a large spherical head with white paper-like skin. Each hand and foot only had three digits, and it had two antenna-like ears, and a face that seemed to be crudely painted on that didn't move when it spoke or ate. It was shy but friendly, and kindly spoke to the two kids for half an hour before the kids left and this creature was never seen again. Sarah Ann Wood was a 12-year-old girl who was abducted while riding her bike. This was in 1993 New York, and was less than a mile from her home. A convicted child killer, Lewis Stephen Lent Jr., later confessed to kidnapping and killing her, for which he received 25 years, which is a shockingly, disappointingly low and lean sentence for something like this. But despite him admitting to the killing, Sarah's body was never found. And despite extensive searches and questionings of Lent Jr., she never turned up. Sarah was described by many as an incredibly kind, clever, funny kid, sometimes described as the happiest girl in the world, always laughing and making people smile, and it is an utter, utter tragedy that she was taken from this world by this absolute disgusting monster. And it's a bit of a dice roll whether we end the episode on a happy or sad or fun note. This week, unfortunately, it's on a sad note, but if you did learn something from this episode, be sure to click that like button. And if you want to follow along with the rest of this iceberg, as well as future icebergs and videos that I put out, then be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Check out our Discord in the description below if you haven't already. And as always guys, thanks for watching.